Welcome to all of you um, this late morning afternoon. Uh, this is the first party seminar of the year, and this is also my first party seminar as director ad, ad interim of this amazing place with an amazing set of people uh, that you represent at least the first iteration of. I hope to see many of you back um, again for, for events. I just wanted to say that uh, Adil Najam, our good colleague and friend, is with us in spirit. Who knows where on the globe he is? That's always hard to tell. But uh, this is very much in keeping with the kinds of issues that have been introduced and developed here at, at Pardee. And I, I want to put our meeting today in the context of a series of things that Pardee has begun to mark out as its territory for, for thinking about, not forecasting, as you all know, but in fact anticipating and thinking about what comes from our knowledge of the past, our knowledge of the present, and to introduce elements such as the ideas about complexity and unintended consequences of interactions, whether they be economic, financial, political, or ecological. And one of the points I want to make today to this audience and with, with my colleagues here is that this is a new additional direction that we're adding to the, par to the Pardee uh, sort of pantheon of ideas and, and people, which is future ecologies. It's hard to imagine a, a future that doesn't include the transformation of interactions between the natural world, the context of human activity, and the, re the regimes of health and of the different kinds of things that the human beings engage in. So this is today, future ecologies is the subtext here. Um, the specific issue that I've asked our colleagues to talk about is invasive species. And within this, this the title, there is the, the implied notion, perhaps, that invasive species are these individual things that we know about in our daily lives, or perhaps that we know about in a global sense. But in fact, each of these invasive species involves an ecology. Some succeed, don't, some don't. The ecologies have to do with human action, economics, politics, globalization of transportation, globalization of economic interactions. So let me do a brief introduction of my colleagues here, since they're all affiliated with Boston University. Many of you may know them, but the, the reason for their joining us today has to do with interactions, unintended consequences, and the particular perspectives that they bring to, uh, to understanding the longer-term future, as it says on the sign outside of our, our, our door. Uh, Les Kaufman, many of you know, um, Les has probably spent more time underwater in more, more parts of the globe than anyone I know. Uh, uh, Sylvia O has 1,500 hours on me. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, <laughs> that's important new information. But Les working in marine and freshwater aquatic systems, particularly in, from my w first uh, getting to know him, about his work in Lake Victoria. So Les is going to, to talk uh, a bit about his aquatic context for invasive species. Rich Pollock is my longtime colleague in the Malaria Malaya, uh, Maze Project, uh, sponsored by the Ford Foundation. We're in our fifth year and final year. Rockefeller. What did I say? <coughs> Ford. Ford. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Rockefeller, how could I say that? The Rockefeller Foundation. Rich also had the distinct pleasure, and I can testify to this, of working with one of the world's great malariologists, Andrew Spielman, that we've dedicated our project to. Um, Andy you know, left, left us um, three years ago, but Rich re reflects the work done in the Harvard School of Public Health's Malaria Laboratory, which is, is and was quite a visionary perspective that we've now incorporated into our project. Rich will talk about this portion of the bugs, um, he's, he does work, consulting work that has Massachusetts Triple E. Um, one of my great um, experiences was to, s to be outside of a small hotel where we just had dinner in rural Ethiopia and to have him on his satellite phone calling down the helicopters to distribute the insecticides to Massachusetts counties that he would say, yes, this one, no, that not that one. So it's something about the globalization of health disease and response. Richard Primack, that we've, we've had less interaction, except I've known his name for a very long time. 
He's got an astonishing website. Those of you who don't know it, okay. many of you, of course, will know him. And so Richard, yeah, by let's make the website. Yeah. Well, thank so you. So what, what about me? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. This is rec recruiting can take place now. So we have represented here three areas of invasive species. Uh, but many of you represent a body of knowledge about very local contexts, global contexts, connections, and then what are the set of interactions that are looming on the horizon. So the format we're going to use today will be one in which each of our guests, in order that we put them here, and I'm not sure there's a rhyme or reason to that, but for Les to talk about aquatic contexts, Rich to talk about um, various kinds of bugs. insects, bugs, and Richard to talk about vegetation. And the geography represented here is, in all of the cases, goes from the very local Concord, Massachusetts, to wherever there happen to be bugs. Everywhere. Bed bugs is, is, Rich brings bed bugs back from our trips to Ethiopia. Less, of course, knows not only New England fisheries, but fisheries in a very global context. So we have a range of geographies we're going to talk about. Not formal presentations, but to engage one another and then to engage the audience in terms of these, these issues. So, Les, why don't you sure. begin? So the classic script, if you want to be an invasive species, is that you migrate to or get stuck into an environment where you have no natural enemies. You uh, there, there had to have been two of them, of course. And then you go wild reproductively, and you edge out native species, push them off their turf, take over the system. And there's a massive loss in biodiversity. And that's pretty much the story. Lake Victoria, the largest lake in the tropics, was infected with a two-meter-long, 100-kilogram exotic fish in 1954 called the Nile Perch. And what we've learned about the Nile Perch and Lake Victoria since then gives the lie to the basic script for invasive species. First of all, most attempted introductions, even deliberate ones, fail. When you move a species from one place to another, the likelihood that it will be able to survive long enough to adapt to local conditions is vanishingly small. So, what we're hearing about in the terms of single species introductions are the exceptions. And when Nile Perch was put into Lake Victoria, we actually know who did it because he raised his hand at the back of an auditorium. The idea was a European concept that they would turn hundreds of endemic tiny little fish into large white fillets. And this guy poured the fish into the lake and it actually took many successive introductions until the fish could reproduce in the lake at all. And it took 25 years of Nile perch being extremely rare in the system until suddenly, almost overnight, beginning in 1980, the population went exponential and the biomass of the fish in the lake went from 1% Nile perch to 80% Nile perch within a five year period. So something happened. They rediscovered sex. Uh, a, a locally adapted mutant appeared. The speculation that it hybridized with another species that was accidentally co-introduced. But it suddenly took off. So the first lesson is it's hard to do. And it takes time for the introduced species to get local adaptations. And what happens after that is highly unpredictable. In the case of the Nile perch, it began to destroy both the habitat and to consume directly about 400 species of fish that live nowhere else in the world. And did you ever see the movie Brazil? Okay, so, you know, the whole world is run by plumbing and, and, and you know, HVAC systems and things. So imagine that that HVAC system is the ecosystem and you just take a machete to it. That's what Nile Perch did. And there were things just oozing out of corners all over the place. There were, there were explosions of abundance of lake flies that would emerge from the lake in clouds so thick. And this was out of season. It would happen all year that if you passed through in a boat, you would choke if you didn't put a uh, cover over your face. Um, small shrimp just exploded in abundance. They began to form a quivering mass that covered the bottom 
of the entire lake. The lake went anoxic, and the shrimp was one of the few animals that could survive down there. One native species of fish went exponential, a tiny minnow, and all the others essentially vanished, except for the Nile perch and another species, Nile tilapia, that was introduced at the same time. And we foretold the ultimate collapse of the system and the annihilation of the protein base for 30 million people. And that is exactly what did not happen. Because what did happen is that this new system, although extremely volatile and violent and changing rapidly year to year, was unbelievably resilient and still is. The Nile perch had so many sources of energy that they could switch to as the system went through its kaleidoscopic turn, it kept changing in nature. From year to year, the perch just switched prey. And the system remained mostly a Nile perch engine. And two to four hundred million dollars a year of foreign revenue from the fishery that was developed to follow the Nile perch brought much needed economic security to three countries in East Africa. Now, of course, most of that money went into private coffers. There are a lot of lurid tales attached to that. So in addition to the ecological surprises, there are huge economic and social surprises. How many of you have seen the film Darwin's Nightmare? Okay, this is a very bizarre film by a friend of mine, or he became a friend in the process of making the film. He went to Tanzania to make a film about the introduction of Nile perch and the extinction of the native fishes. And he called me halfway through the film from, he would call at three in the morning from phone booths, um, and apologizing that the movie was no longer about fish, it was about people. Because what he discovered, what he claimed to discover, were two things that we knew. One, that the introduction of Nile perch and the growth of an export fishery cut women out of the commodity chain completely. Normally they, the men catch the fish and the women sell them. And as a result, in order to get fish to sell, the women had to sleep with fishermen to just get the leftover frames after the giant Nile perch had been filleted. AIDS took off. Children were orphaned. They began to burn the cartons that the fish were shipped in, the styrofoam, to get a high. Um, there was just huge social unrest. The number of jobs at Lakeside numbered in a few hundred thousand as a result of the Nile perch. Ten million people flocked to the shores of Lake Victoria. So all of a sudden you have this enormous um, detached population, feral population of people who have nothing to do, no jobs, no nutrition. And on top of everything else, uh, Hubert, who made the film, asked, what happens to the planes that carry the Nile perch to, to uh, Europe? How do you afford to bring them to Africa? And his answer, which the Tanzanian government disputes, is that those planes were loaded with guns and tanks for the wars in Central Africa, and that material was transshipped through Mwanza to Angola and the DRC and the Central African Republic. All of this from Nile perch, from the introduction of an exotic species. Now, some people will say that much of this would have happened anyway. But I think the important thing is that when you modify a biological community, the potentialities and the constraints change utterly. And you don't know what's going to happen. You also don't know if it happened because of the introduction or because of other things. It's a meaningless question. The whole constellation of interactions has been transformed. So the, so the take home lesson from Lake Victoria about introductions is that when you introduce a new element, or many new elements, actually many species were introduced to Lake Victoria, when you introduce them, you change the game rules. You don't know exactly how things are going to reorganize, but what happens is you create a new kind of community that has been called recently a no-analog community. An example of a no-analog community is the Pleistocene megafauna. Today, there's nothing like what dissolved into the La Brea tar pits. We don't have, you know, giant condors and ground sloths and elephants roaming around North America. The, the whole system is different now. Similarly, the oceans of the world have been stripped bare of the surviving megafauna. The great white sharks, in fact, all the sharks, the dugongs and manatees, the turtles, they're missing. And so what we have now in the world ocean 
is a no analog community that's the result of extraction, of annihilation. So it can go either way. You can add or subtract, but it, when you do this to a complex system, the outcome is uncertain and always exciting. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. Uh, it's a great start. Um, Switching gears, now for something completely different. I think it'd be helpful uh, to sort of step back and uh, to help with the discussion later on and for the audience members uh, to better understand what it is we're talking about here. And then I'm going to tell my own stories uh, that I probably can't hold a candle to yours th on that. I made uh, mine up. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, you know, if I can do that. But, uh, what is an invasive species? You ask uh, 10 people, you're going to get 11 different answers. Uh, but it's something that's actually defined in law, in federal regulation. Uh, an invasive species means an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. All right, well, that could be just about anything, but um, it, it, it gives us a framework. Yeah. Part of my training is in epidemiology, and so I sort of consider the, the world as sort of like a big host um, and all these little infections uh, coursing through. Uh, what, is, or what, is, what causes a disease in one kind of animal, uh, for instance, uh, the Lyme disease bacteria in white-footed mice, uh, causes essentially no pathology or, or very little. But you put it into the wrong kind of animal, like one of us, and you end up with disease. Uh, so things are different, uh, and the infection still takes, but uh, the, the, the way we perceive it uh, is, is considerably different. So where, where am I getting to with this? That is that um, members of a species, which are part of the, the normal native ecology in their own home range, uh, they're not an invasive species. If, if members of that group are transported intentionally or accidentally elsewhere, and if they cause this kind of harm, uh, well, okay, they're considered an invasive species. But it, it, it kind of damns the whole species in, in some respect. It depends on where they're introduced to or where they're, they're, they're invading, uh, the seasonality, the climate. So the same tick that is that might arrive at Boston Logan in February and not have a chance in surviving, uh, if it arrives here in June and somehow gets out and lays eggs, well, it could be a big problem. Uh, it, so it, it's a judgment call as to whether you consider it an invasive species or not. All right, enough on the, the et etymology of all of that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, a larger conceptual uh, idea is, is this. Uh, what do we do about it? And I know that's not necessarily the, the goal of this session, but uh, there the, are uh, vast sums and en energies put into trying to interdict uh, what potentially invasive species. And it's, it's a lot of effort and, and money is still going towards that. Um, but rarely is there a good risk assessment as to whether it makes sense to do that versus trying to, uh, uh, to stop the things once they've arrived. And there's a, there are great debates raging right now uh, among scientists in the invasive biology community on this. Uh, so this might be a, a theme that we can talk about a little bit. Um, can we stop something from coming in? Uh, can we predict what it's going to do when it gets here? Uh, and if it does get in, is there anything we can do about it? or is it, is it too late? Okay, so those are the general comments. Uh, the specific things, a couple of examples. Uh, so I deal with all sorts of insects, uh, particularly those that find me and you folks attractive. So mosquitoes and ticks and fleas and bed bugs and lice and all those lovely things that, that uh, creep people out. Uh, that's how I get my, my fun. Uh, so those things and, and the things they transmit. Uh, so a couple of examples uh, of, from those, those kinds of uh, individuals. In the 1930s, actually it was late 1930s, there was a, uh, an entomologist working for the Rockefeller Foundation who uh, was wandering about uh, in uh, Brazil. Uh, he was there consulting uh, for the Brazilian government and for the Rockefeller Foundation on uh, the epidemic of yellow fever that was raging through the area and trying to uh, do something about it. 
um, on, on one of his days off, he was wandering about and he looked down into a puddle and he noticed uh, a mosquito that he instantly recognized was one that shouldn't be there. Uh, he called it Anopheles gambi. Uh, it's the, one of the most significant vectors or the vector complex in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so this is one of the members of that group. Uh, he knew it shouldn't be there. He knew the potential. Even though there was malaria of various types transmitted by local mosquitoes, and it did burden people, uh, caused illness and death, he knew that this mosquito, if it became established, and it likely was established, uh, would cause havoc. And he went to the, uh, to the government officials who said, ah, oh, we already have malaria. Why, we already have mosquitoes that transmit it. Why do we need to worry about this? Yes, it's an introduced species. Big deal. It's just it's another mosquito. Uh, well, as this fellow had uh, anticipated, uh, the population of this mosquito blossomed. And uh, the, the result was uh, a tremendous epidemic of malaria. Uh, it was much more efficient as a vector. There were many more people that became infected by the various kinds of malaria parasites. Uh, much greater mor uh, morbidity and mortality. And it wasn't until many years uh, into this mm -hmm. when uh, no, none of the workers were able to, uh, to harvest the crops that the government decided, okay, let's do something about it. it was, it's, it's a very long story. It's a fascinating story. There's a whole book written about this. Um, the upshot is um, it's one of the few examples where a, an invasive species, uh, an introduced mosquito, was actually eradicated from a country, uh, actually eradicated from a hemisphere. Um, if, ha if it had not been contained by geographic uh, and topographical barriers, uh, it probably would have spread throughout South America and would still be causing tremendous death uh, to this day. Uh, a little closer to home and uh, more recent in time, um, well, you all know about West Nile virus. Well, that's an invasive virus. Uh, it, it's not native to uh, this country. Well, it is now. Uh, it's here. It's likely going to stay. Um, but that's a fascinating story by itself. Uh, it's probably the fourth horseman of this complex relationship. The mosquito that mainly transmits West Nile virus from bird to bird is uh, Culex pipiens, at least here in the east. That's an introduced species. Uh, that probably came in in the earliest days of sailing vessels, probably in the bilge water of those old sailing vessels. Uh, and it established, it does very well. Uh, it, it does particularly well around human habitation and disturbed environments. Um, and it's with us. Well, it's not too much of a pest uh, by itself. Um, but it's out there. Every catch basin on the street, or the storm sewers, is a wonderful habitat for this mosquito. Every gutter uh, on our homes is a great habitat. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, so that's, that's one of the, the horsemen. Uh, a second one would be um, uh, the Japanese creeper, this vine, also known as Boston ivy. Uh, which covers the sides of our academic buildings and, and other buildings. Uh, it's a wonderful habitat for, it's an introduced uh, plant, but it's also a, a wonderful habitat for the third horseman, uh, which is the European uh, or house sparrow, which was brought in in 1868 or so uh, for various reasons. Uh, that's worth a whole lecture by itself. Uh, now, that bird is a very good host. Uh, a, a blood meal host for, for these mosquitoes. It also is particularly suitable for harboring West, West Nile virus for about a week or so, which is enough time to amplify the virus and allow it to be transmitted by yet other mosquitoes. Um, and then, uh, well, then, then the virus. Uh, so the fourth one, uh, which arrived here uh, in North America in 1999 and is spread right across the country. Uh, and these things are now part of our local ecology. Um, and there, there's still people deciding, well, we need to eradicate it. There's something we, we must do to, to control it or eliminate it. Um, there are no good answers. But that, that's another example. Um, uh, I'll just finish up uh, many other things uh, mm -hmm. that might be of interest. Uh, well, there are other mosquitoes. We have uh, two, perhaps three new mosquitoes that have arrived in Massachusetts in the last few decades. Uh, one is just right lapping at the, the edge of uh, the Massachusetts border, and it might be here. What if, if uh, we see uh, the effects of global warming, uh, 
uh, maybe this environment will be more conducive to it. And uh, this mosquito can also be a pest and can transmit a variety of things. There are hundreds and hundreds of species, so you know, we, we could go off on a tangent with any one of these, uh, but those are just a few examples. And, uh, and actually, I used a dozen or so as, as part of a full year course at Harvard uh, th that I entitled Uninvited Guests. Uh, it was just on invasive species. So I, I think I'll stop there and, you know. No? Okay. Well, great introduction so far. Thanks very much. And again, kind of just repeating the definition of invasive species. So an invasive species is really, generally people call it a non-native species, which increases in abundance to the detriment of the, of the native species. And we have lots of examples of these in Massachusetts, and I'll really talk mostly about plants, uh, just to give that perspective. And in general, these kind of invasive species outcompete and replace the native species. It's really a huge problem in the United States, which just keeps getting more attention all the time. So a recent estimate was that 42% of the endangered species in the United States are threatened by invasive species. So 42% of, this, of the endangered species are directly threatened by, in, by invasive species. So it's a very major problem for maintaining the biological diversity of the United States. There's also some economic estimates, which people almost kind of make up out of the air. I think they're kind of uh, a lot of uncertainty about these estimates. But one estimate is that invasive species cost the United States $120 billion per year in costs. But most of this cost is really the cost of uh, getting rid of agricultural weeds. So it's really agricultural weeds, which are non-native invasive species, I mean, are really the, the main threat in terms of our, our, our economy. So these invasive species have come here because of a lot of different reasons. A lot of them, is, as was mentioned, came by the Europeans when they first arrived in North America. The Europeans not only brought ship ballast, but they also just were, were wildly releasing species they wanted. North America or wherever they went to be as much like Europe as possible. So they were just releasing all kinds of plants and birds and insects. And some of these species became invasive. A lot of species were released as part of agriculture, horticulture, aquaculture. So for example, in the case of plants, you know, large numbers of plants were, were grown in people's gardens because they were beautiful or economically valuable, and then they became invasive in the surrounding area. And the most dramatic example of that we have around here probably is purple loosestrife, which was uh, planted as, as an invasive species, or is planted as an ornamental species, and then uh, started spreading into all, all the wetlands throughout New England. Um, a lot of species are transported by accident. And again, Richard mentioned some of those. Another example is biological control. A lot of our most invasive species were introduced to control something else and then became invasive on their own. Uh, a point has also been made that most species are, don't become invasive, and there's kind of a 10% rule of invasive species, which is that about only about one out of every 10 species which is introduced into an area will be able to reproduce on its own and only about one out of those 10 species will become invasive. So there are about 5,000 plant species which have been introduced into the United States, which seems unbelievable, but 5,000 species have been introduced into the United States, and out of these, you could figure about 500 reproduce on their own, and about 50 of them are really truly invasive. So that's the 10% the rule. Um, Again, just think about local examples. So if you go canoeing on the Charles River, you're just struck by the fact that, that the Charles River is full of water chestnuts. So water chestnut plant is just, just totally bogging the waterways of the of Charles River, or water milfoil is another example. And they were introduced uh, as ornamentals, or in the case of water chestnut, maybe for the uh, edible tubers. And they just you know have become invasive, and they have out competed the native species or taken over habitats where, the, where there were no native species. The general rule of thumb for invasive species is that invasive species occupy habitats which are altered in some way. And so they were able to outcompete the species because the environment has been altered in some way which they can take advantage of. And the most obvious kind of place are very disturbed environments. So environments where there's a lot more kind of digging up of the ground, um, clearing, cultivating of the soil, or digging up of the soil create conditions which are suited to 
invasive plant species because they're able to tolerate the disturbance much more than the native species. But in fact, the whole environment has now become disturbed by human activity. So if you just think about things like acid rain, so the soil is more acidic than it used to be, or nitrogen deposition. So when we burn fossil fuels, there's all this uh, nitrate dust which is created, which then comes down. And the environment, the soil environment, has now much more nitrogen than in the past. And a lot of these invasive species probably are better at taking up nitrogen from the soil, and this allows them to grow more vigorously. But we can also think about things like climate change. So as temperatures get warmer, a lot of the invasive species might be able to tolerate the warmer conditions more than the other species. And then we also think about habitat fragmentation. So we just have a lot more roads in New England and trails and people walking and people using mountain bikes. And with all this kind of breaking up of large continuous habitats into smaller pieces, it provides more of an opportunity for the seeds of plants to get in or for invasive insects or invasive animals to sort of come into these habitats where they couldn't. So in the past, people used to say, the place where you see the most invasive species are the most disturbed habitats. And that's certainly true. So if you go to the Charles River, for example, or along the Muddy River, it's virtually all invasive species or non-native species. And very few native species are still along the Charles River. There's still a few there, but not so many. But generally, as you go to less disturbed habitats, there's more native species. And, but even when you go into the most remote areas, there, there are still at least some invasive species in those areas, but very few. I mean, if you go to, for example, in New England, into kind of country areas of New Hampshire, there's probably no invasive plant species inside of the forest. There's maybe a few invasive insects or, or birds that can get in there. But eventually, those areas will become disturbed enough so they will be probably invaded, at least by some species. <coughs> One interesting example is Concord. Concord is, Concord is great because Concord is the most well-documented place botanically probably in the United States. And when Thoreau was working in Concord, about 80% of the species were native. About 20% of the species were non-native. Some of those species were non-native but not invasive. Probably most of the non-native species that were growing in Concord were not invasive, but some of them were invasive even in Thoreau's time. So about 80% of the species were native species and 20% were non-native. In the last 150 years, we've changed that. So there's now 60% native species and 40% non-native species. So the native species are not only declining in numbers. So the native species are declining in numbers. The non-native species, non species are increasing in numbers. But also the individual species within Concord that are still there are declining in abundance. So many native species which used to be common in Concord are now rare, and many of the non-native species which used to be rare are now very common. An example of this is garlic mustard. So garlic mustard was this non-native species. It's this little small mustard plant with white flowers, and they used to be present in low numbers 150 years ago in Concord and throughout Boston. And then beginning around 20 years ago, garlic mustard sort of transformed. It went from kind of, you know, kind of a, a nice, interesting uh, European species that was often found um, uh, near polluted habitats where there was a lot of extra nitrogen in the soil or places where people walk dogs. You could often find garlic mustard plants. And suddenly, garlic mustard exploded 20 years ago and has now become extremely abundant and a very aggressive invasive species. Um, in the southern New England area and in Concord, and that's probably because it's better able to take up nitrogen than a lot of the native species. Uh, mostly talking about New England, but I mean, this is really happening throughout the world. And one very dramatic example, for those of you from the West Coast know about, is the plant called brome grass. So traditionally in the California landscape, a lot of the grasslands in California and other places in the West there were often perennial grasses and shrubs in a lot of the, uh, the areas of the West. And, but there were no annual grasses which <coughs> lived um, in, the, in the prairie areas, and, or the prairie or chaparral or desert areas. And in these areas, we now have European and Asian grasses, which are called brome grasses, which are annual grasses. And these grasses uh, grow very quickly in the spring, set their seeds, and then afterwards, uh, the dead plant material catches fire. And we now have fire in the deserts and in the chaparrales much more frequently than ever occurred in the past. 
And as a result of these fires, it tends to kill a lot of the perennial grasses and kill a lot of the shrubs and makes the area more suited to annual grasses. And the reason that the grasses were able to grow there is because they're able to take up the nitrogen that's now in the soil, and this allows them to grow faster than any plant could have before. And so these areas are being transformed from being ecosystems with mostly perennial plants to now mostly non-native invasive annual plants, mostly grasses. So it's a whole transformation of ecosystem characteristics. So what are we going to do about invasives? There's a number of strategies for, for dealing with invasives, but probably the most important one is never let them get there in the first place. So there are certain known invasive species, and it's very important that there be border controls or very close monitoring to make sure that the invasive species sort of doesn't get there in the first place. And the next thing is monitoring habitats where the invasive species aren't there, but monitoring to make sure they don't get there. And this is something that we need a, a lot more of, and particularly to eradicate them when they first arrive. So an example of this is the spotted knapweed. So spotted knapweed is a terrible problem in the western United States, and they're starting to become isolated patches of it in southern New England, and, but nobody's really watching it. So it's going to get established here, and it's going to become very aggressive in our habitats. But nobody's really doing anything about it. It occurs in West Concord train station, and I've told the town officials about it, but they don't seem to be very worried about it. And they're going to wake up one day, and it's going to be everywhere in Concord. So that's kind of, you know, things need to be monitored and eradicated once they, once they first arrive, but before they're very common. Once invasive species become really common, once invasive plant species become very common, they're incredibly difficult to eradicate because they often have a huge bank of seeds in the soil which comes up year after year. Or often you can eradicate 99% of them, but 1% remains and it can quickly produce seeds which then repopulate the whole area. So it's very difficult to eradicate things. And again, kind of an example from Concord, uh, there was a proposal a few years ago to create a invasive, to make Concord an invasive plant-free zone. The plan was to eradicate all the invasive plants from Concord. And they did it kind of as a trial. They, they tried eradicating all of the, the, the oriental bittersweet from this one patch of land that was about 50 feet by 50 feet in, in a kind of a hundred, several hundred acre woods. And apparently like whole crews of volunteers were out there um, cutting and poisoning for like days and they just managed to complete this one patch of 50 feet by 50 feet. And by the next year, it looked completely unchanged. I mean, all the bittersweet just simply grew back. So you really, it's very difficult to eradicate things once they get established. The only way to really eradicate them is by biological control. So trying to find very specific insects that only eat that plant and no other, that's probably one of the only ways of getting rid of, of invasive plant species. And there's a very interesting case at Great Meadows, again, another example from Concord, where purple loosestrife was a terrible invasive plant there and was outcompeting all the native plant species on which the native insects and wildlife depended. So an invasive or a biological controlled beetle was released into Great Meadows. It eradicated the purple loosestrife or largely eradicated it from Great Meadows. And another invasive species, the American lotus, came in and took over all the same habitat. So we had this kind of replacement of one non-native species by another non-native species. And then kind of a, f a final comment. So one of the big discussions about invasive species, which is presently taking place, is whether we shouldn't just accept them in a lot of circumstances. So there are a lot of very disturbed habitats, particularly in cities or roadsides or places where you have a lot of changing environmental conditions, where these invasive species are creating new kinds of habitats, new ecosystems, but they're providing ecosystem services. So they're, they are absorbing carbon dioxide, they're producing biomass which can be harvested, um, they're stabilizing the soil, and so they may be providing some benefit to us. And in situations where we can never reestablish the native vegetation anyway because of the seed bank, because of the altered conditions, we should just learn to love the invasive species and, and accept them for who they are. discussion for questions and comments, um, analogs to the cases brought here. These are 
um, anecdotal in one sense, but there's also, I think, overall, one has a, has a sense here of <coughs> that notion of future ecologies, the interactions, particularly that, uh, that Richard on the other side um, int introduced. One last dimension I'll add here for us to consider, and then please uh, raise your questions, would be the other kinds of invasive species in which one sees on a landscape we began our project in, working in southwestern Ethiopia five years ago. Look at the landscape, look at the, the varieties of species that were there, insects, plants, uh, different kinds of ecological contexts of where water was. And what we found was at the end of five years, it had become totally covered, uh, engaged with one plant, maize, corn. Uh, there is rich. Why? Because not because ecologically it was more mm -hmm. suited. One had to provide fertilizer, add nitrogen, had to do a whole series of things to cultivate it. It was human interest in the economic value, and the government policy to say grow this, not that, resulting in a transformed ecology. And in effect, the human transformation was a little bit like like um, Michael Pollan pointing out that the reason people like marijuana and tulips and the other examples he has is because humans like it. <coughs> Persuades humans that this is the thing to begin to transform their own environment. So sometimes it's invasive species that are unwanted, unexpected, sometimes very much expected and provided for by humans. So that's a dimension there, a little bit like perhaps the Nile perch. Um, but with that change in this one environment we're talking about, the one ecology, included new, new species of mosquito, mosquitoes no one anticipated. New varieties of everything, including humans, transformed by the economic and government context therein. So with these examples and our distinguished colleagues who know a great deal, well, first of all, comments from the group, and then let's move to the audience. Oh. Rich. One thing about the picture, uh, the three uh, non-natives in that, uh, the, the center picture, where I'm one of the non-natives there in Ethiopia, uh, holding up maize, which is non-native to that continent. And if you look closely, maybe those in the very front row can see tiny little holes in the leaves. Uh, those are caused by the European uh, corn borer. So it's, it's yet another, uh, well, it's increasing diversity in some odd way, uh, locally, all of these non-natives in there. Um, enough silliness. Uh, let me uh, let me start the ball rolling by asking my colleague, uh, my left, uh, a question. The issue of eradication. Uh, how practical is it? And I think we need to define what what eradication is. Can you have partial eradication, or is that uh, population suppression? Uh, eradication, in in my lexicon, is complete elimination, mm -hmm. and that's very very difficult to do. It's it's almost never done, it's never successful. Uh, uh, the closer you get to reducing the population of whatever the pest is, the more asymptotic it becomes. It, it's, it's more difficult to find the remain, remaining individuals, mm -hmm. the more expensive it is. And at some point, you have to accept failure. Um, so that, that's an issue. You, you folks tried to eradicate these in Concord as well, didn't you? That's right, Concord yeah. banned bottled water. Uh, well, there's, there are, it's probably very, very difficult to eradicate most species once they're established, but control is another possibility. So for trees, for example, invasive tree species like the Norway maple, it's probably possible to control that um, because they grow relatively slowly. They don't reproduce until they're many years old, so that, that kind of could be a target. But for garlic mustard, for example, eradication is probably impossible because the seeds live for 10 years in the soil. And so that's probably impossible. For biological control, you're also not really going for eradication, that what the biological control does is it really kind of, the insects attack species when they're in concentrations, and so you often have you know, scattered individuals much further away which, which can survive. Can you just broaden our perspective a bit? If you back up a minute, so what we've got going on in the world now are minute enclaves that actually vaguely resemble what was there before humanity took over the world. And then you have humanized environments which constitute what, 40 percent now or so of the land surface? Mm -hmm. Some very, very large percentage of the land surface. Mm 
And then you have what Richard, number one or two over there, alluded oh, to. Call me the plant guy. The plant guy <laughs> alluded to, which is that in the marginal zone between the uh, humanized landscape and the wilderness, what's left of it, is this vast area that's been compromised. And in that kind of zone around people, the anything that gets an edge, anything that people have moved there, potential invasives, exotic species, are likely to do better uh, and, and establish a new kind of community than are you to see the wilderness come back into that area. And this is a reversal. If you read uh, literature from the 19th century, people were astounded at the vigor with which jungle <coughs> or any natural vegetation type would recolonize space that was left fallow. I think we've seen it go the other way now, and it may be because of this monumental bank of seeds and eggs and propagules of exotic things that are just waiting there to monopolize these marginal areas. So it's, I don't think, I think the, the genie's out of the bottle here. I don't think it's still even possible to go around eradicating things. I think it's a totally different situation. And uh, if you look at the, the, you know, the army that's on the frontiers trying to save what's left of wilderness, it's kind of a pathetic, uh, pathetic scene. Uh, so I think the real question is, what can we do with this middle ground? Can we tip it a little bit the other way? I just have one sort of comment for the bug guy, and actually for <laughs> us also, which is that I'm kind of struck by all three of us have mentioned examples which have happened very recently of invasive species. So we're not talking about like some textbook examples that, that took place in the distant past, but that all of us within the last 10 years have seen tremendous transformations of, of invasive species. Actually, at this point, maybe we could invite Tom Kunz to make a comment because he's studying um, white nose syndrome in bats, which is also a very recent invasive species. Do you want to mention that one? Well, actually, I was just going to comment on a broader context. Each of you basically gave examples. The underlying theme was competition as, as a driving force for invasive species. But it turns out there, there, there's more than competition. And, and many animals, for example, uh, that, uh, and I, I bring up the idea of what we call uh, pathogen pollution, uh, which is occurring uh, with emerging diseases, and certainly a fungus that causes white nose syndrome is, is one of them. But many, uh, our environment, which is both plant and animal and fungi and microbes and so on, we need to really consider that microbial evolution of microbes is, is rampant, and, and uh, that Many animals, for example, uh, don't have the immune system uh, that to handle uh, introduced pathogens. And this fungus that is killing bats is one example that the, the immune system is compromised or, or not effective against the, this invasive um, pathogen. But there are many others of viruses, and I think Rich could probably address this better than any of us here, uh, having not only be a bug guy, but he's also a uh, a virus guy and a bacteria guy and so on. So I went, I'm uh, maybe moving over. <laughs> 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 so maybe Rich could could continue this discussion a bit about w one of the problems that, uh, in terms of uh, invasive pathogens, is uh, really affecting our environment and will continue to affect our environment. Uh, we can't really control many of these viruses and bacteria and fungi. So, Rich, I. There's not much more to add to that. Uh, it, 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 it's a great jumping off point. Uh, uh, well, we are bringing in a bunch of things, uh, whether they be microbes, viruses, whatever, that we've never seen before. And there are no natural predators uh, for, for well, the larger creatures, the insects. Uh, they're not necessarily natural um, uh, creatures that, 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 that they're there may be not uh, native creatures that will feed on the plants that are brought in. Um, this can be expanded to, to any kind of uh, ecological system. Uh, so there's, there's no immunity in that respect. Uh, then there are those, there are the, as, as a tangent to that, uh, there are the viruses that we have, uh, as an example, uh, mutate. Well, all of these creatures mutate. And so we end up with these odd uh, populations, offshoots, that act differently, uh, which um, the host is no longer 
uh, as able to defend itself against. So we, we see examples of that as well. Uh, so this is a dynamic and complex system. It's constantly changing. Um, we don't know where we are necessarily at this moment. We don't know where we're going to be next week. Okay, let's move to, we have about half an hour, and what I would like to do is to engage the audience to, uh, to ask questions, to offer comments. Uh, and perhaps my last one would be from the chair, is to say that what we should anticipate is the unanticipated. Mm -hmm. That in fact, if we ex ex expect complexity and expect interactions, and we look to identify them into future generations, both by measured by decades and by the reproductive uh, calendars of these, these uh, various species, that that's one of the ways of looking forward and say we have to expect these unexpected responses and learn from them, uh, both uh, passively as scholars, but actively as people like actually everyone here who's taking action and making choices about what to do and what not to do. I think you've heard that today. So uh, questions. We have, uh, wait for the microphone. One back here and one back here. One way back now. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, Jano Mendler de Suarez. I I'd like to ask you to go back to kind of um, Jim's opening framing, looking at the issues of um, complexity, and specifically, um, I'm wondering about if you can elucidate a little bit more on the role of complexity um, in relation to the resilience of systems. Obviously, um, we, we really have no more um, pristine systems on the planet, whether you want to say that, you know, the anthropogenic influence of climate change or industry. You know, many of you mentioned the, you know, the opportunistic um, species that are capitalizing on more nitrogen, but, you know, we also have these temperature changes that are kind of, you know, pushing whole ecosystems. Uh, horticultural zones are moving. Um, we see in, you know, global fisheries the transformation of biomass, you know, from fish to jellyfish. And I think you know we need to we need to look at what creates the opportunities and how to manage um, if we can't mm -hmm. eradicate. And I'd like to maybe to give you a little bit of focus. Ask how you feel about um, management approaches like marine protected areas or the you know terrestrial preserves as ways to um, conserve um, complexity rather than specific. Um, Biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what? Or do you want to go around? No, no, no. Just to mm -hmm. the microphone for the next question. Um, well, I think in complexity is our only hope because uh, one of the things about complex systems is they, they don't have an infinite number of states they can assume. And something like a, a preserve, whether it's marine or terrestrial, what it really creates is a nucleus within which, toward the center, there's the highest probability of that original system persisting. And it all depends upon how well enforced it is. So we looked at marine reserves. We just finished a study in which we looked at marine reserves in 23 countries. And what we found is that, like, 99.9 .9 bar are not enforced. But the ones that are work, even if they're astonishingly small. So we make a lot of the extraordinary aggressiveness of these invasive species, but in fact, a natural, I, I mean, a, a non-humanized system, given a little bit of a chance, can become a nucleus for the recrystallization of a fauna and biota that's much more similar to what adapted in, that, in situ, in that environment. So I don't see marine reserves as a solution uh, to everything. I see parks and reserves as kind of the seeds that could sow a new no, non-analog community that's some strange combination of what was there before and the forces that we re really can't resist anymore. I'd also like to mention the fact that in so many of our conservation lands which have been studied in Massachusetts, what we're finding is that the number of species in those <coughs> parks like um, in Concord or the Middlesex Fells or in Needham, Massachusetts, that the number of, of plant species in those areas is declining over time, that native species are being lost and they're not being replaced by uh, 
either native species or non-native species. And so one thing which many biologists are considering right now is the idea of what is called assisted migration. So instead of just simply watching our conservation lands, for example, like Concord, declining in terms of abundance over time, that we actually look to the south, for example, to, to a place which is a little bit warmer, like Connecticut or Rhode Island or uh, New Jersey, and we start transforming or transporting species from those places further to the south of here into Concord so that they will be able to establish themselves and be able to adapt to the warming climate. This is called assisted migration, and this is really one of the most exciting and kind of most discussed topics right now in the field of conservation biology. The argument against doing it is that even though you might be increasing the biodiversity, you might accidentally be creating new invasive species. So you might be taking species from, say, Connecticut and bringing them here, and they would become invasive. And so this is why most people think that we shouldn't be doing this. But I'm actually one of the people who believes that we should do it because the chance of a, of a rare species from Connecticut, a rare native species from Connecticut, bringing it up you know, one or two hundred miles further north of its existing range and then it becoming invasive is so astonishingly small. And that what's almost certainly going to happen is that these wildflower species probably won't grow very well. It's very difficult to create new populations of rare wildflowers. And so I think we should start doing it now and gaining that experience. And that's the context of climate change introduced there is a, is a conscious part of the process of dealing with the issues. And also political ecology, since this has to do with law, enforcement of law, maintenance of a public awareness of, uh, of, of issues. So, Zach, you're the next. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Premack. Mm -hmm. um, so, you mentioned the example of the garlic mustard and how um, it really just likes all the extra nitrogen in the ground. Is there any examples of similar species or a species that really focuses on one aspect, completely depleting it, and then the ecosystem returning back to normal or to its baseline? Yeah, I, I think generally what people say is that invasive species alter ecosystems and take them away from their, their original condition. So I think that there's really no example I can think of where something comes in and alters it back to the original condition where it can survive itself. And I haven't heard about that. I mean, I think that they generally really just totally transform um, an ecosystem. And you, you experience that yourself if you ever go in canoeing on the Charles River because, you know, in the past you used to be able to sort of, you know, go down the Charles River and the whole river was pretty much sort of open bank to bank and now you just have all this water chestnut forming this sort of carpet there, um, which is very difficult to move through. And by being difficult to move through it, it means that the water chestnut can grow even better because there's nothing disturbing it. So I think that in general, invasives tend to alter ecosystems in a way to their own advantage. So, so you're saying there's no clemency in succession? Yeah, there's no succession back to the original situation. These, in, these invasions, the, in, the invasives are only healing in the sense that they will take a disturbed habitat and often stabilize it. So in that sense, they provide benefit. So in most areas in New England, if you have very disturbed soil after, say, construction or creating a house or building roads, and you don't do anything to it, that gradually plants will come in there and they will stabilize the ground. They will form a, a, eventually a forest canopy there, and that will tend to prevent erosion. So that, in that sense, it's a very beneficial function, and that's why a lot of at least some ecologists think that we should be embracing um, these non-native species. Did it ever overcompete with itself too much? You mean to the point where it, it excludes itself? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, it's a little like chemicals. Can it ever poison yeah. itself? Yeah, well, I think that some trees do this. I mean, so I mean, even some of these non-native trees, for example. So if you for example, establish a black locust, for example. So black locusts will form these stands, and then in the inside of the stand, there'll be no black locust seedlings because it's too shaded for them. But that's kind of the natural process of, of succession, that many trees won't grow up under, their, under a dense canopy cover, that they either it's from other species that they create themselves. But kind of on the fringes of the black locust, for example, if you look at a black locust stand, you know, on the fringes of it, there's just huge amounts of black locust or black locust seedlings. And the microphone. Identify yourself. Um, my name is Marion Wong from um, biology department. Um, I've got a question, I guess, mainly for Dr. Kaufman, in that um, Dr. you. Kaufman. 
<laughs> Sorry. In that you mentioned when the null perch was introduced, there was a trade off between a reduction in diversity of the native cichlids but an increase in resilience of the remaining ecosystem. Um, and I can see that, in some respects, an increased resilience of an ecosystem may be actually beneficial, for example, to the human communities that rely on fish as a source of protein and so require this kind of food security. So in these kinds of situations, I was wondering what your opinion is about how much we should control that particular ecosystem as opposed to simply embrace it and try and, and find... Well, the, the, the wonderful thing, Maz, is we don't have a lot of choices in that case. We're not going to get rid of Nile perch. We're trying very hard to do it. Uh, they've succeeded in, there are two kinds of overfishing, growth overfishing, which means you take all the big ones, but they're still big enough to mature so that you don't run out of them. And recruitment overfishing, which means you take so many big ones down to such a small size they can't reproduce anymore, and then you lose them. So in, in Lake Victoria, we only have growth overfishing, and that's, that's why they're resilient. The other reason they're resilient is that when you take the predators down, the native prey go up, and the predators grow faster on the native prey than on the exotic ones. So there's this, that's the most beautiful thing we learned. So there's, there's a complexity, a de novo complexity in that system that wasn't there before. But I want to be careful. It's not that the new system is more resilient than the old. It's that we expected anything but the old to be untenable. And we were wrong. It is possible to have an extremely low diversity system that is resilient. And I find that frightening because it means that all the value that is stored in the biodiversity of the world is at risk, much greater risk than we appreciated. Uh, hi, my name is Anne-Marie. I'm from um, the College of Communication, a science journalism student. I have two questions. The first is, do invasive species ever become native species over a certain period of time? And uh, the second question is for Dr. Premack. You mentioned biological control. Do, in, do you know of examples where invasive species are used as biological control for other invasive species? Or do you always, um, or are methods uh, specifically catered to using native species as methods of biological okay. control? So, I mean, the first question, I mean, do invasive species ever become native? I mean. They don't because they're not here originally. They didn't evolve in this area, so they would always be classified as, as non-native. But one thing which is interesting is that sometimes native species are sometimes considered as invasive. So sometimes people alter the conditions such that native species will increase tremendously in abundance. And so, for example, we've altered the conditions right now in New England such that deer are essentially invasive. So the deer populations have become so large that they become nuisance, that they're actually, uh, their numbers have increased to the point where they have very serious negative consequences for wildflowers in our forests, and they're causing erosion. They're probably vectors of, of the carrying Lyme disease from place to place. So many people would say that they are like invasive species in this area, or another example might be the coyotes. Um, probably not here originally, but certainly increasing in abundance now. Uh, and the, the second question is, where do we find biological control agents? We always find biological control agents in the places where the invasive species originally came from. So if people, if biologists want to find biological control agents, they go back to the original habitat where that species occurred, and they find a, an organism which is a specific predator on the invasive species. And so in the case of the purple loosestrife, people went back to the areas in Europe and Asia where the purple loosestrife is native, and they found an insect which is as specific a feeder as possible. In the case of purple loosestrife, I mean, they actually found a beetle which I think only eats purple loosestrife and nothing else. Um, so, and also there's nothing really in our native flora which is very closely related to purple loosestrife, and certainly nothing of economic importance. So that's where they always look. There, there are some odd examples. I think the Colorado potato beetle is one, uh, which uh, I, I think that that's an example where, where potatoes were not native. They were brought in, and yet they were attacked by a species that was here uh, feeding on other things. So um, it's sort of a reverse of that. 
and the case where I, I think um, Thoreau was remarking in 1850 about the thing, that my gosh, in Littleton, a few miles away, someone shot a deer. There was a deer there. He was, <laughs> he was, he was shocked and amazed. And the transformation of wild turkeys, or in the case of deer, it being an invasive sort of species, now has become mm. pest-like. Pest uh, yeah, so one attacked our mailman. <laughs> no, a, a turkey. The, the, the turkey did. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yes. You see them often on the way to work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to give, yeah. give one other example of how a native species has become an invasive species, and that is uh, what is commonly called the corn earworm moth or the cotton bollworm moth. This is a moth that's been is native to the southwestern U.S. Uh, its original host uh, were wildflowers. Hmm. And it turns out they still, that's the first generation of hosts that they use. But now that they're monocultures of cotton and corn, uh, they proliferate in these, in these mono-agricultural systems and have become invasive and very serious. One of the, the, the moths in the world that is the most serious uh, pests of agriculture. I wanted to ask a question about vines. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm Joan, Joan Krimlisk. Um, I'm an alum of BU. And um, let's see, I um, vines that if they're cultivated, you know, they can have a trellis and grapes are quite a large industry. But other vines, um, when they cannot stand alone, um, they can strangle other plants and uh, grow. So I just was wondering if you could comment on those. Well, that's certainly a, you know, a class of, of invasive species. I mean, I did mention bittersweet, for example. Um, another one is um, Japanese honeysuckle. Um, Screaming crazy kudzu. Kudzu, which we <laughs> actually, there's a, there could be a little bit of kudzu maybe in the Boston Harbor. But I mean, certainly purple loosestrife is the greatest you know, invasive species around here. Um, so I mean, they, they really are out of control. They grow up on native trees and, and pull them down. They have fruits which are dispersed by birds so they can go from place to place. If you cut them, they, they re-sprout. So they're, they're really a terrible problem. I've actually never heard of any really effective way of controlling bittersweet other than actually just cutting them down manually and poisoning them. So very serious problem in this area. Hi, my name's... Are you on? Yes. Okay. The video. Oh, okay. My name's Andy Sutton. I'm an artist. Um, and I have a question for, I, I guess, all of you. I'm interested in the tying some of this conversation into the economic, political, social factors. And I'm wondering if there are any instances where there's actually an economic or a political or a social benefit that happens in the promotion of biodiversity or of natives or of you know, something that's outside of a oh, sure. you know, gigantic cash crop or, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's on a different scale. Um, I'm sure Richard will want to speak to this, but one of the, one of the mechanisms we've, I, I work with an organization called Conservation International, and one of our primary tools is the development of natural products. Um, so for example, in coastal Brazil, in the Atlantic rainforest, um, it, sounds, it sounds unlikely, but the production of honey from native bees that live only in the rainforest is one of the forces that's helping to preserve the tiny little fragments that still remain. And there are a lot of examples of that. I mean, in marine environments, um, there are like the, the curio trade for seashells could be sustainable. And then you need to have the whole reef in order to, in order to have any seashells. So there, there's a whole literature on that. I wish, I wish it could say it could hold a candle to like, Cargill and those guys, but uh, no. Richard? Do you want to, do you want to? Richard? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm just going to pick up on, on the comment about bees. Uh, honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought in hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, I don't know anyone who <laughs> considers them to be invasive species, but they sort of would fit the bill partly. Uh, but yet, uh, those that have been uh, bred uh, with slightly different traits, they're still honeybees, uh, the Africanized honeybees are considered uh, villains and, and invasive in areas where they've moved into. But that, again, is a judgment call uh, for those uh, beekeepers 
uh, that are able to cope with uh, the Africanized honeybees, they're, uh, they're absolutely a wonderful resource. Uh, they, they get up earlier in the morning, uh, they fly later uh, and under uh, poor weather conditions, they work harder. Yeah, uh, Africa. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we just don't want them in our own backyards. That's, that's the issue. So, uh, yeah, so bees are a good example, something that's been e exploited. Great. My name is Arzu. I'm uh, with the Science Journalism Program. I'm wondering, when you, when you discuss possibly embracing the invasive species, is there, is there a way to do that by accommodating them in some way so that they don't push out other species? Well, I would say that when you accept the native species as being appropriate for a circumstance, I mean, you have to make sure that they don't go on beyond that into the, into the native areas or into national, natural protected areas. So I think that that's you know, one of the concerns there. Uh, you can see an example of, of, of the difficulty of doing this at, at the Arnold Arboretum. At the Arnold Arboretum, they grow huge numbers of non-native species, some of which have the potential to be invasive. And if you go into the surrounding properties, the surrounding forest areas around the Arnold, Arnold Arboretum, you can see that, th that often there are these really strange weeds growing in the woods or the edges of some of these forests. And the reason is because they are the, the growing up from the seeds brought into those areas by birds flying from the Arnold Arboretum into those places. So they're just really odd weeds there that you would never find anywhere else in, in New England, but just in the properties near the Arnold Arboretum, because that, that's kind of a focal point for these very unusual species, some of which have the potential to be invasive. So you have to be careful whenever, whenever you're growing, growing up things like that. Yeah, um, botanical uh, gardens, uh, zoological gardens are uh, historically uh, terrific foci. Uh, we had two zebras that got out from the, the, the zoo here. And the guys with the hoofs? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, you know, as far as we know, that they didn't breed and they're not uh, rampaging uh, down <laughs> uh, uh, Commonwealth Avenue, but, um, you know, uh, it's a silly example. But, uh, no, those, those are areas where uh, there's great risk of escape. So uh, at what point do you decide to do something about it? I think you have to decide first as to what is an acceptable uh, level of um, intrusion into the environment. Uh, how, what is the, uh, the economic or public health or other harm that might come of these things? And at what point does it make more sense to take action? Um, it, it's a very delicate balance and not necessarily any uh, right answers that people are going to agree on. Can, can I take issue with that? Sure. Okay. I think actually the situation is one where we've unleashed a lot of dysregulating forces by moving species around. And actually it's up to the younger people in the world, in the, in the, world, in the room, I can cop out now, um, a job has been forced on you a job similar to that of Adam and Eve. You are the gardeners of the world now. Uh, you don't really have a decision whether to tend the natural garden or not, whether to give it that slight edge that it needs. You need to do that to preserve your options. You need to prevent the world from becoming entirely homogenized by weeds. If you fail to do that, your children will pay the price because an enormous amount of natural wealth is sequestered in these natural systems. It's not that there's something wrong with weeds. A lot of them taste good. A lot of them are weeds because they were useful to us. Now, you don't know what we're going to be needing tomorrow. So I, I just want to add to that also that, that we're mostly talking about plants in terms of plants becoming invasive. But actually, what, one thing which continues to impress me is how many fish and aquatic organisms are moved He's around the me. world in the uh, aquarium <laughs> trade. And so we actually, supposedly like after, I guess, Hurricane Andrew or various other hurricanes hit Florida, all these aquariums, both commercial aquariums as well as the aquariums okay, in people's I, houses, just washed out into the Atlantic Ocean. I know where, you, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> and so like, one example is there's lionfish right now, which is this ornamental fish, which is now just devastating, apparently, a lot of the ecosystems sort of off the coast of Florida. And that's because of people like you. No, no. You want to know the irony of this? The irony is when Hurricane Andrew hit, I was hoping that all the Lake Victoria cichlids that were held in facilities in Homestead would get loose and populate Florida. And they failed. You mean the utterly. lakes? The lakes in Florida. Yeah. Not the ocean. 
No, the lake, the lakes. They, but they failed. I mean, we had 200 species here, and, and they were a complete disappointment. <laughs> I had not heard that, this attributed to wolves, but. Species, um, that used to be there, so that's considered, you know, um, environmentally impacting as well as economically with the ranchers and such. So I'm wondering, um, with the controversy issues of the wolves, they're not really being considered as an intrusive species, but they're, by what you outlined before, um, Dr. Pollock, might be qualified that the cane toads are not qualified Well, let me just clarify one point. Uh, the, the definition I read is, is one of the uh, federally recognized uh, definitions of an invasive species. If uh, there are, depending on which agency of the federal government you talk to, you, you, you'll get a slightly different definition. So um, uh, it, just because it doesn't necessarily impact uh, human health or uh, our e economic uh, situation doesn't mean it's not an invasive species. It's also, it's, it is intriguing why the society mobilizes against certain species. I think it depends to some extent on publicity and, and charisma and who the leaders are and what the characteristics of the species. So in Newton, for example, there's just, where I live, there's just huge interest in getting rid of Japanese knotweed. So I think it's because it's very easy to recognize, it's very distinctive, it also sort of feels good when you rip it because the, the kind of the stem snaps in a very kind of satisfying way when you rip it out. <laughs> so I think that people like to get rid of it. It's also kind of big plans, so it's kind of, again, it's kind of easy to go after and it's or very good to organize school groups to eradicate Japanese knotweed. Whereas purple loose strife is much more difficult to eradicate, for example. Yeah, I, I think that it, it, to some extent it's the squeaky wheel that gets the money. Um, if you can demonstrate a real economic harm, then your elected officials are more likely going to pass some sort of legislation uh, to put money towards doing something about it. Um, so as evidence of this, uh, well, again, there's an article in the local paper today about the, um, the, long, the uh, Asian longhorn beetle uh, that has been found and yet uh, another community a little further the infestation's a little more extensive than it had been uh, expected. Uh, there's a lot of money going towards trying to uh, search, uh, detect, and destroy these things. Uh, I, I think one argument is at what point, uh, is it gonna be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, that someone's gonna say, well, we've been spending money on this for X number of years, um, we still have them. Do we accept them or not? Or do we just keep spending money on this? Well, we spend a lot of money to control, like measles, and measles is going to be here for a long time. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of organisms that are that do not find favor with us, <laughs> and and we want to create an environment where they are rare, even if you're not going to completely get rid of them. But I, I mean, what you're citing, Asian longhorn beetle, has enormous economic and emotional impact where it appears. What strikes me as interesting is that we do have a focus on Asian longhorn beetle, which I think is justified. I don't think the state of Massachusetts has a coherent plan for the restoration of old growth forest. We only have places where trees are growing, but I don't think we say, we have any places that say this will be left alone 
for 400 years, because that's how long it takes to restore the biodiversity of an eastern deciduous forest. So I advocate policies of getting rid of longhorn beetle, even if it's impossible to completely eliminate it, but it has to be balanced, doesn't it, with some kind of vision of what you do want and some kind of energy put in that direction. Let's take one more question and we want to, we want to, we want to close and find a good point of closure, mm -hmm. please. Um, a couple of you have mentioned poisons, and so I wanted to ask about poison ivy as a natural poison, and is there a purpose or a reason that it appears, and then is it, uh, do you have to fight a poison with another poison? Well, I mean, poison ivy is, is a native species, but it's a species which obviously has benefited from disturbance. It's what grows very well along roadsides. Um, it probably is able to take up nitrogen. Um, but you can't really use it to fight other vines, for example. It doesn't work. I would say it's almost you know, an, an example of, of a species which is almost invasive within its, within its own range. Um, but you can't really use it to fight other vines. You use it to fight your the, neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, another interesting thing about poison ivy is that poison ivy is one of these species which seems to also be thriving under higher CO2 environments. So there actually have been some laboratory experiments which <laughs> suggest that, that with higher CO2 levels, it's actually mm -hmm. stimulating it to grow, to grow more, and also certainly with higher nitrogen levels. Yeah, kill poison ivy, walk. <laughs> Well, let's draw this to a, to a close with just a couple of comments. First of all, thanks to our, to our guests, our colleagues.